My name is Kate Russell and today we are taking on the digital gender gap. It is a huge topic. A recent government report shows that only 15.5% of STEM workforce in Britain are women. That's excluding the medical uh, professions. Um, but that figure actually plummets to just 8% when it comes to engineers. So what's going wrong? Well, to help me get to the bottom of things, we have three fantastic guests, all brilliant women working in the digital sector. We have Jacqueline Dorocas, who is digital executive with Citrix. She has Citrix, sorry. She has over 25 years of experience in leading technology businesses. Anne Watson is CEO elect for Semter. She takes over the role in January, having been with the organization since 1998. And Alison McLaughlin is Head of Public Sector Industry and Services for SOPRA and plays a key role in public sector ICT policy and its implementation. I want to talk first about the current balance that we experience in the UK workforce. Now, science and engineering are major contributors to the prosperity of uh, our country, around 800 billion a year to the UK economy, and 10% of the world's top scientific research happens in this country. Um, now this has led the coalition government to state that for our prosperity to continue, the government believes that we need high levels of science, technology, engineering and maths, STEM subjects, um, as well as citizens that value them. So, easy statement to make, right, on the surface of it, but not so easy to achieve. Um, who wants to pick this up first? Maybe Jacqueline, what, you know, what's your experience? Because obviously you're, you're at boardroom level, um, you know, and, and, and the tech sector really suffers at boardroom level specifically um, with, with female leaders. What do you think needs to be done to encourage more people to look to STEM as a career choice? Yeah, so I think it starts at the top. I think, um, you know, it's very difficult to turn the tide at boardroom if you haven't caught it at STEM level, for one, but we are where we are. And I think we certainly need more female leaders choosing other female leaders in our businesses. And what, what we see in the boardroom a lot is we see a little bit of tokenism um, with not a sustainable succession plan in place. So, you know, once you lose that token CEO or um, token female on the board, there's not a great deal of planning that's gone into place to retain that gender diversity uh, on the board. So, so that's a big issue and I think one that we need to challenge business on, frankly. Um, and I think most businesses would say that that's something that they really need to look at. Um, and, you know, at Tech UK, we need to um, find a way to continue to challenge business on that. By the way, most people are very open to that. Um, and most people believe that the boardroom is a worse place for it for not having that diversity aspect in, in, their, in their teams because the markets we serve are obviously very diverse too. And, um, you know, we need that female talent there. I think part of what we also have to do is to challenge the people putting the short list together for the boardroom. Um, so, you know, the recruiters, the executive search firms who are putting short lists together need to steer clear of proximity hiring and sort of spread their net a little bit further onto the next generation talent. We've got some really talented women who don't necessarily actually think they're ready for the boardroom, but probably are um, because of their common sense and practicality capabilities. So. You know, I would say that um, part of my job and a lot of, lot of the work that I do is to get next generation talent into, the, into a shortlist scenario with exec recruiters so that they can socialize with that new talent. Um, otherwise, it's the same old people that we normally get to talk to and, that, and that's not great for getting new people, new faces on the board. There's an element as well. I mean, we're, we're talking here role models, right? We're talking here, you know, having women in industry that, that young girls and also young young women coming through um, their, the early parts of their career can aspire to be like. And it's really important to have great uh, role models for women, women. But I'm sort of getting the sense more and more that actually in some ways there needs to be a really good structure of role models for men too and boys too to learn how to make the atmosphere more inclusive and acceptable for women. Um, you're nodding, Jacqueline. Is that something that you yourself have, have, have found? 
What I discovered when I first started um, looking at the issue was that women were talking to women um, only about this issue. And there are lots of women-only forums. And um, all of the work that I do now engages men as well. And I think, you know, it's very, it's very tricky. It's, it's good to vent in a room full of women. Um, but I actually think it's great to be inclusive um, with males in the room who can alter um, the outcome. Um, and also be open to the fact that, you know, there is a gender gap, there is a gender opportunity. Um, and let's face it, all men have women in their lives in some way. It could be daughters, nieces, you know, sisters, mothers, whatever. Um, and, I, and I absolutely believe that they also, um, you know, really believe that there should be an opportunity, an equal opportunity for women to thrive in our, our industry as well. Um, but we do need to be inclusive, not exclusive. And I think that's really, really important when we're, when we're going forward with this agenda. Okay, Alison, I'm going to come to you. Um, so in March, the government invested 300 million to support growth in jobs in, in, in UK science and technology. With every one pound spent on research, expected to generate 50p for the wider economy year on year. Sounds great. How's it going? Do we know? I mean, it's, it's March now. Has there been any kind of movement? I still hear all the time industry crying out, there's not enough. Um, I was just in meetings this morning, even just talking about in Scotland, we're worried there's not enough people coming through. A lot of new businesses struggling, saying I need you know, good opportunities for great businesses, can't get the staff to do the jobs to meet the business demand. So I think there's a load more needs to be done. I think there's also, yes, it's about teaching, but there's also the image and awareness of a lot of science and, and you know, my own area of, of IT, I think. I think it's all, all often roles that are hidden and people don't even think of that as being a career choice or they think of it as something that's about sitting at a computer, you know, with a bunch of guys writing code and there's such a broad range of jobs that you can do within IT and science and I don't know that there's, it's not even just about the subjects themselves but what they do and the impact they have that I think that, that there could be a lot more done to sort of improve or make more visible the kind of opportunities that there are for people to encourage not just girls but generally more, more people into, into these kind of roles. So we got a question that's coming from um, Jules, who said, "Now this is an interesting one because social media tends to be now, you know, we, we've all heralded it as the way to get the message out, you know, sort of on mass, quickly, inexpensively." Um, but um, Jules actually asks, "Is social media robust enough to promote the work of organisations working on promoting STEM inclusivity?" And that's interesting because we do all tend to go, "Oh, I've got something to say." put it on social media but maybe social media is actually not reaching enough people what do we think I think um, generally I think the, the the stem arena and particularly the employers have, have still got to to embrace social media more um, I do think when it's used in the right way it can have fantastic results um, but it is very much around the, the people who are directing the social media having more of an insight into the people that they're actually trying to engage with. Um, and one of the, the initiatives that SEMTA has is the Industry Apprentice Council, um, which is great. It's a real mix of female and, and, and male apprentices. Um, and it's very much about encouraging more young people into engineering and STEM through the apprenticeship route. So it's not seen as kind of plan B rather than plan A going to university. Um, and they do particularly well because they're the same as the people that they're trying to engage with. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's the social media per se. I think organisations and particularly engineering companies have got a lot to learn about how to better engage the, the people they're trying to reach um, through these new channels. And it's I not think that's true, actually. Just, I'm just adding to that, Kate, which is that you know, part of why social media works is because it creates communities, exactly um, what was just being said. And I, I, you know, I think that that's really important that you can't just put it out there and fling it out there and expect that cyberspace is going to do its thing. I think by creating communities of people with like-minded issues, opportunities, challenges, then that's when the viral nature of social media becomes, you know, really potent and, and super leveraged. Um, if, if we just think that, you know, if you open a shop on the internet and just, and just, you know, hope that someone's going to come and visit you without creating a community, it's never going to work. And the same is true of you know, digital communities to promote STEM or to promote like-minded issues. I think you've got to create that community feel, otherwise it's going to go nowhere. 
I don't think you get something for nothing. Um, one of the biggest problems which remains a headache across the sector, though, is sexism and discrimination, uh, right? You know, and it blows up, particularly in the games industry. You know, we've heard a lot of vitriol and, you know, sort of horrible things going on. And they, again, they spread through social media and get very, very high profile. Um, according to Women in Scientific Careers, which is a report by Andrew, uh, Andrew Miller, MP, Chair of the Commons Science and Technology Committee, just 17% of all professors working in STEM subjects are women. And the report criticises specifically biases and working practices that result in systematic and cumulative discrimination against women through STEM study and academic careers. Do we hold with that? Do we agree with that? Is that what's our own, I mean, you're, Jacqueline, you're in the boardroom. What, what's been your experience with discrimination and sexism through your career? Yeah, so it's, uh, in my career, I mean, I've certainly had, uh, you know, a few, but I, I have to say I've, I've had the easier things to deal with are when you know that there is sexism in place. Um, and that you, you know, I've had um, certainly in my career where someone has said to me, we don't have women on the leadership team, I hope you realize that. Um, and I've also had um, someone turn around and say, may I introduce you to our managing director? And the customer has turned around and said, oh my God, you're a woman. Um, so, but you know what? What's interesting, the gift and the miracle in that is that at least you know that's what they're thinking. Um, I think the harder thing to deal with is when you don't know what they're thinking, and that's much, much more tricky. Um, so, you know, the unspoken, um, uh, you know, I think issues against women are are much, much more difficult. I would much rather that the the, the bias was spoken out loud, it, 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 and sometimes you can tell. But um, do I do I operate in a male-dominated industry? I would say absolutely. Have I come across sex and discrimination? For sure, um, does it happen today? I think it probably does in in, in any um, vertical. But what I would say is that we've got such a male-dominated um, environment that you almost you almost expect it. I think, um, and I think you have to stand up and and you know make a difference and make sure that the, the gender balance is redressed by having you know, much, much more in terms of numbers um, at, at a higher level in the organization so that you change the culture because it's the culture that will make the difference um, at mm. grassroots level, I think. Absolutely. And um, the UN launched a He for She campaign um, last month, which is, you know, the, the, it's all about gender equality. And their sort of key message is that the um, the responsibility for change doesn't just lie at the doorstep of the female of the species, um, you know. What, and I think that's really important. That it's not just about women needing to change or women needing to action change, but actually that men have to res take responsibility for their own part in this. Um, and if you if you experience, what's your experience with sexism and discrimination? Have you felt it's held you back at all? Um, from a personal point of view, I haven't felt that it's held me back, although um, early on in my career I did work in very heavily male-dominated traditional environments where you did have to kind of avert your eyes from the um, this kind of the playgirl calendar and, and, and playboy calendar and, and things like that. Um, and I think you've just you just got to get on and do your job and, and show that you're, you're an equal. Um, but I think one of the, the positives is, is, as you say, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, and recently, some of the, the large STEM um, organizations wrote to, to David Cameron actually signing up to a 10-point plan around diversity and equality, actually show that, that they were starting to lead the way. I think, I, I think we do need to do some some you know positive discrimination to help change that because I think what happens is I don't think men always are consciously you know sexist towards women but might do it subconsciously because they're used to working in an environment that is all men and it's around how men work and that can just be frustrating for women so until they perhaps act until they actively understand and, and genuinely I think want to have women into that and, and actively look to, to change that. I think we've we've got some way way to go. And I think there are things, you know, that we haven't touched on, things like still seeing childcare as being the women's issue, I think is discriminating to men as much as it is to women. You know, I think there's lots of things like this 
that, that, that needs to be addressed before we're, we're in a genuine place with equal opportunities for, for both. Join us on Twitter to carry on the conversation and make a date to watch us next time. There'll be more information about what we'll be talking about um, throughout the coming weeks. So keep an eye on the Google Plus page. But in the meantime, thank you very much to my wonderful guests and to all you for watching. So until next time, stay connected. <laughs>